Well, we're looking at support today, and uh, in the try to finish this uh, series of uh, lessons on on uh, support for preaching, uh, because uh, we need still to look at some of the other things that are supported and how that's being done in the New Testament. And uh, remind you that this was requested by somebody who is not in my family, um, so it happens. There's. Uh, Bible teaching about this, and it's good. Now, I have a quote for this section, this leg of the journey that I have heard uh, before, which you may or may not have heard before, but I've heard it. Um, if it's good enough for Paul, shouldn't it be good enough for you? Uh, by which they mean, if Paul didn't accept support, then you don't need to accept support either. Uh, why aren't you like him kind of thing, which is an interesting thing, um, of course, nobody honest has asked that question, but let's keep going. First Corinthians 9, Paul does say, nevertheless, <laughs> which is an interesting thing, and it is worth looking at it. First Corinthians 9, 11 to 12, if we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share this rightful claim on you, don't we even more? Well, True. People who collect taxes and, and f who collect fees and, you know, membership dues, things of this nature, right? They're conferring some benefit. There's a reason why you're doing this. And if we have sown spiritual things, is it too much if we reap material things? No, it shouldn't be. Spiritual things should far outweigh material things. If others share this rightful claim, don't we even more? Nevertheless, verse 12, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. So even though he says that it isn't too much to reap material blessings from doing spiritual work, he still is not going to accept any uh, monies from them. They, he didn't accept anything from Corinth that said we will endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel. And this obstacle, actually, this word only occurs here in the New Testament. It's a somewhat unusual word, but it's an interruption or a stop, uh, a check. And in fact, there's a place where it was used to describe a stairwell um, that had been etched into a wall. So there's those cuts, if you will, or those interruptions in the wall. Um, so he's saying, we don't want there to be any stuttering. We want nothing, you know, to interrupt the flow of the gospel. But what else does he say, right? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right. However, what he actually says is it's commanded. In 1 Corinthians 9, 13, don't you know those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple? Those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings. In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. Well, it is an interesting question. Don't you know that they who are so employed get their living that way? And that was uh, the first lesson that we looked at in this series how exactly we're talking. Very precisely, 11 tribes gave one-tenth of their income uh, of everything that they gained in a year in offerings, a memorial portion of which, you know, a handful of the grain or whatever else was being offered would be burned on the altar, but the majority of which went to the family of the Levite who was making the sacrifice on their behalf. This is how they lived. That's what they ate because they didn't have lands that they could work. They didn't have the means. And as Hezekiah said, they need to be able to do the work of, the, of ministering before the Lord on our behalf. And so they're being supported. It very, it's very literal about this. And people are bringing this offering and the priest who makes the offering takes that to himself. That goes over here. Uh, to the side, this is going home with him at the end of the day. Which is an interesting thing, but he said, don't you know that's what they did? And it is what they did. 
In the same way, the Lord commanded those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. He said, in the same way. Now, I don't think that this is binding tithing, uh, which I don't even know what, what the word tithe means. I don't know where they got that word from. But, you know, 11 tribes gave a tenth of everything. When he says in the same way, I don't think he means that you're going to collect a, a yearly tithe. Uh, he means in the same way in so far as, you know, they were able to earn a living doing the spiritual work and they didn't have their own fields that they had to work, but they got to eat produce from the field nonetheless. That's all we're getting at. So that the Lord intends for those that proclaim the gospel to be able to focus on proclaiming the gospel and not have to work with their hands in the fields in order to eat the produce of the field. That's all he's saying in the same way. But it is a command, and we should look this up. It, uh, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. I think that the King James says ordained. He ordained that, it, that those who proclaim should get their living, uh, which is just, you know, English from a different era. 400 years ago, that's kind of a, a reasonable use of the word ordain. Today, when we say ordain, we have a very precise technical meaning of a denominational concept of certifying or degreeing somebody to be able to be a preacher or minister. And that's, that has nothing to do with this at all. This is a command. And so we'll look at the other places where this same word is used. 1 Corinthians 16, 1. Concerning the collection for the saints, as I commanded the churches of Galatia, you also must do. Uh, the collection is also a command. Uh, people sometimes will say it's an inference, and I don't know why they would say that. I don't know where they're coming from, because the Bible says it's a direction. Do you have to follow directions? Yes, starting in kindergarten, starting in pre-K, right, in, in uh Preschool, you have to follow directions, right? Everybody is supposed to follow directions, and the Lord has directed. It's a commandment is what this is. They're commanded to give. The churches of Galatia received a commandment, which applies to Corinth as well, and by inference applies to us, of course, as all these letters do. Otherwise, why would you read them? But that's a command. Is giving commanded? Yeah, well then, is supporting preaching commanded? Yeah, it is. Titus chapter 1, the word command occurs here as well. Paul said, this is why I left you in Crete, Titus, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I commanded you. So he has a command, a direction, an order from God about how you do this meaning the, the uh, requirements that uh, you look at when you are going to make somebody an elder, which is the, the job of the evangelist, according to Titus. Uh, this person is receiving a commandment, and we also are receiving that commandment. We have to appoint elders the way they did it in the Bible, and we have to follow the instructions, some of which are here in Titus 1, some of which are in... Um, 1 Timothy 3, uh, but, you know, and, you, and you'll find other places, uh, 1 Peter 5. There are other places that make references to what it is to be an elder, what the office of the elder requires. Um, but this is a commandment. It has to be done the way that God commanded that it be done. And I suppose you would say, but if they're commandments, why are they so controversial? <laughs> And I, the, all I can tell you is, I have no idea. That's not my job, man. <laughs> my job is to teach what the Bible says. This is what the Bible says. Elders are appointed by the evangelist. The evangelist does so by the commandment of God. Why don't churches have elders? I don't know, man. Um, contribution is done by a commandment that has been handed to the congregations. Why do some places think that this is optional or, uh, you know, not 
required of everybody. I don't know why. That's not what the Bible says. And the same thing is true about the support of preaching the gospel. People just get this idea that that's optional because Paul refused the money. So we should just find somebody who's like Paul that refuses the money. But it's actually commanded. Just like the contribution, just like the eldership. And when it comes to getting their living, it's interesting to find the same word in Matthew 4, 4. He answered, it's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God, which I thought was a nice, that's a nice one to bring along for the ride, you know, that they get their living and we live and we need bread to live. It's true, but we really need the word of God. And so even those who are preaching the gospel and intend to get a living from preaching the gospel are not living by bread alone. The, the gospel itself is the word. That's the material here is the word. All right. So now the question is, so, OK, it's a commandment from God. Yes. If it's a commandment, then why didn't Paul accept the money from them? Why didn't Paul accept money? Well, there are specific reasons given. There are specific reasons given. The first one would be this idea of the, um, of the uh, entrusted stewardship, meaning he was entrusted with something. He has a, a specific uh, lot in life. On the one hand, the other thing I would point out is that Paul did accept money. It's not that he never accepted money. It's that he didn't accept money from Achaia, which I hope that we will be looking at here shortly. And in the end, what you'll find is that the reason, the real reason for this is to undercut the false teachers that were in Achaia. That's the whole reason. But there's lots of things at play here. So first, we'll look at the entrusted with a stewardship thing. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 15 to 19. So here's Paul's explanation. He says, however, I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any such provision for myself. I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting, for if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. Necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. If I do this, then if of my own free will, I have a reward, which is to say a payment. The word here is, it is reward, but it's also pay for what you have done, your check. Right? If I do this of my own will, then I get a check. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. What then is my reward or what is my check? That in my preaching, I may present the gospel free of charge so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. For though I am free from all, which is how he started the chapter, am I not free? He is free. However, Though I am free, I've made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. All right, so he is free. He does have the right, as it is said many times over in this passage. It is a right. It is a wage. It is pay for work done. If you, you know, if you go to work, whenever you do it, Monday to Friday or whatever it is, do you expect them to pay you? Probably you do. And if they stop paying you, is that a problem? Probably it is. That's what you would call a right. You have a right to your wage. That's all. So the Bible presents this as they are doing work. They should be compensated for the work. It is a right. Paul, however, is not using this right. He said, If I preach of my own will, I have a reward. Meaning, 
if I choose to preach and I do this work, then I get paid for doing that. But if I preach and it's not my own will, but I'm required to do it, then I am entrusted with a stewardship. And this is just about the worst possible translation <laughs> that you could come up with. <laughs> it says that he is, uh, it says he is trusted in this. It's the same word that is translated faith. So there's faith in him. He's being, he's being considered faithful to be a steward, meaning a steward of the house. This is the same word that occurs in Luke when you, you have the, um, uh, the account of the, the, the steward who was called into question about his service and had to give an accounting for the work he had done and how he was very shrewd and, and uh, did what we today think of as collections, you know, where you got a percentage off. Uh, so that he would have a soft landing on the other side. That person who is in charge, the person who is managing, person who has uh, been uh, put into the care and keeping of somebody else's property, that's the meaning here. He says, if I'm not preaching of my own reward or of my own will, I am entrusted with a stewardship, meaning I am to be faithful overseeing God's property. Well, let's see, what does he mean by this? Entrusted with the stewardship is Ephesians chapter 3. The word stewardship occurs, and we should look at it. This is an important point, I think. And so we're making it. Ephesians 3, 2 to 5. He said, you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace given to me for you. The stewardship here is, again, the care and keeping of someone else's property, the house, you know, the steward of the house. The stewardship of God's grace given to me for you. How the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. Oh, so what is revealed to Paul, because he's an apostle, he has inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he receives direct revelation. That he has written and when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known uh, to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So the revelation before, the revelation now. right In the, in the New Testament, when Paul is talking, he has got inspiration by the Holy Spirit. He writes that down we, on reading it, can perceive his insight into the mystery, meaning it's not mysterious anymore. Right? But this, in other generations, was not made known. It has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets. This is the thing that is the stewardship given to him for our benefit. The inspiration the scriptures, the charge to write them and to teach them. In a parallel fashion, you see this in Colossians chapter 1, where verses 25 and 26 say, I became a minister according to the stewardship from God given to me for you to make the word of God fully known the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. Perfectly clear, isn't it? This clearly parallels Ephesians. Now, Ephesians chapter 1 is another thought about this stewardship, which is translated here as plan. Which, you know, I don't know. There's just, there's just a bias for plans and programs. <laughs> It's the way people think. Ephesians 1, verses 8 through 10. He lavished grace upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a stewardship for the fullness of time, a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, in heaven and on earth. But see, God has, as it says, 
lavished grace in wisdom and insight. Remember when he said you get insight into the mystery of Christ when you read this. Making known to us the mystery of his will. And he, he made that known to the apostles, which he set forth in Christ as a plan or a stewardship for the fullness of times. Which is where we are. This is the fullness of times. The apostles have revealed what God wanted revealed. In, again, in chapter 3 of this same letter, Ephesians, verse 8 and 9, To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the nations the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the stewardship, or the plan, of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. This is the same thing. The stewardship has to be this revelation he received from God. The teaching that he has been given to do. The scriptures that we have. In 1 Timothy he wrote, chapter 1, verse 3, beginning down to 7, I, I, as I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, Timothy, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different teaching nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. See, stewardship there is the same as what he said in 1 Corinthians 9 and faith there is the same as entrusted in 1 Corinthians 9. Timothy, you have to stand up for the revealed truth of God, the revealed truth that came from the apostle. In this case, it came from Paul. He has been given that stewardship, and it is by faith. See the contrast. Stay there. Charge certain individuals not to teach a different teaching. Tell them not to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. The end of that is speculation rather than the truth, the revealed truth of God, the Bible. Stewardship from God by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion desiring to be teachers of the law despite the fact they do not understand what they're saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Right? The stewardship, the stewardship is the revelation of God, the, the uh, promulgation of God's word in this world. That's what he's talking about. So when he says, well, if I do this of my own will, then I have a paycheck. Yeah, a free person who chooses to teach the gospel should be supported to do that so he can focus on it. But he's not free. If not of my own will, I am still entrusted with the stewardship. What he means by that is it's his duty as an apostle. He has to do this. That's very different. right? As, as an evangelist, I'm not claiming to have inspiration. Um, I'm not claiming that God has spoken to me or given me some mystery to reveal to you or that I've been sent, whether here or anywhere. And people say, when did you get your calling? I say, uh, my phone never rang. I, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> What's that? Uh, no, I, I make no such claim. I'm just a normal dude. And Paul is a normal dude who has been made into an apostle and has a charge from God that he has to do this. If not of my own will, I am entrusted with stewardship, meaning he has this thing that he's received from God for us, the mystery that was not revealed before, but is now being revealed. He has to. That's his job as an apostle. Now, we'll go back to 1 Corinthians 9. Um, but... You know, the stewardship thing is pretty important. Um, it gets obscured by the translation stewardship and plan and whatever else. But though it's really talking about the revelation, the, the, the work of the apostle. Here we talk about the fact that Paul did accept money 
He just didn't accept it from Achaia. And what's Achaia? Well, these are the Greek city-states. It's kind of the, you know, the near Mediterranean around the Aegean Sea. But let's look. The fact is that he did accept money. He said in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 22, to the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. And he says this in reference to his support and lack thereof, which ties directly to Acts chapter 20, verses 33 to 35, where he tells the elders from Ephesus, one of these Greek city-states, I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me too. In all things I've shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said it is more blessed to give than to receive. Paul is saying, when I worked among you all, I did not accept any support. I worked with my own hands to provide for me and for those who were traveling with me. And this is intended to show you that we have to work hard to help the weak. That's true. The churches of Achaia were weak. We'll have to talk about this. But they were weak. And so he, one of the things that he's doing to handle this, to deal with that, to be strong for them, was he was working hard. What do we mean by that? Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive, which is a general aphorism, it's true. But very specifically, he's saying that this man will be repaid for the good that he's doing eventually. Now, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 is a literal example of what we're reading here that happened at Ephesus. But it's good. We'll tie these together. In 2 Thessalonians 3, verses 6 through 12, we find the tie is that Paul is providing for himself by means of working hard. He says, We command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you. Nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor, we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. Not because we don't have the right, but to give you an example to imitate. Even when we were with you, we used to give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. But again, there's a lot of things here, and they're useful things to our lesson. But again, I want to focus on, in on what was said in Acts 20 and how it compares here. In Acts 20, he said, You yourselves know these hands provided for my necessities and those who are with me and by working hard, we supported the weak. Here in 2 Thessalonians 3, we can read how that he said, we were not idle when we were with you, meaning we had no downtime, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. With toil and labor, we worked night and day. What does that mean? Toil and labor, night and day. It means they worked the day shift, you know, making a living, and they also worked at night, preaching the gospel that we might not be a burden to any of you and burden comes up again that's why I've highlighted it but he means we didn't make we didn't get any money from Thessalonica we worked around the clock to provide for ourselves and to preach for free why did we do that it wasn't because we ha we don't have that right they do have the right to their pay for the work that they have done it was to give you an example to imitate. And that accords with what he said in Acts 20, that I've shown you that by working hard in this way, we must support the weak. And remember what Jesus said, it's better to give than to receive.
but we would tie this as well to Philippians chapter 4. This is very important. I think Philippians 4 is misunderstood uh, almost universally. This passage is precisely about the situation we are discussing today. The fact is that the church at Philippi, which is in Macedonia, not in Achaia, it's, I think it's maybe near, well, I can't remember. Um, it's further away. It's not among the Greek city-states. But the church at Philippi supported Paul while he was doing the work in Achaia. There's two, there's at least two places where you find out that this is so. One of them is here in Philippians 4 where he says, even in Thessalonica, you sent me a gift. But the other will be in 2 Corinthians where he makes mention of the fact that I did not, I did not accept money from you all the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. That's this. And that's what this passage is about. What he's saying to them is, I know you had to stop supporting me for a time, but you have started doing it again, and I am in receipt of the support that you have sent. That's what he said to them. Philippians 4, 10 through 19, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you've revived your concern for me, you were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. And so this is true. There are a lot of places that simply cannot provide the support. That's the way it is in the world. They were indeed concerned. It wasn't that, that they didn't care about Paul or that they didn't understand his need or they didn't understand the command. It was that they lacked opportunity, as he says. They just couldn't get it done for whatever reason. Maybe they didn't have enough people. Maybe they themselves had a famine or a depression or something that happened in their country. I don't know. But it's good to understand that they love each other and it's not about that. Which is why he says, not that I'm speaking of being in need. For I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. So he's not saying to them, oh, but I'm needy. Uh, this is not charity. It's work that he's doing, not charity that he's receiving. But it's also the case that he said, I, but I can do this. Whether you support me or not, I can still do this. As he says, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. But he's saying very clearly, he can do it when he doesn't have enough support. He can do it when he has more than enough support. Any and every circumstance, he said, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and facing hunger, of facing abundance and facing need. He knows how to live. He knows how to make it and to keep going and to keep the gospel going, whether or not he has what he needs. As he says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. They said it's Christ who strengthens him to get through the hard times there. And there were hard times for him. There were certainly times when he did not have enough, when he faced hunger, when he faced need. That did happen. So that's worth remembering. It was kind of you to share my trouble, though. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia... No church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you alone. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. So again, Philippi is in Macedonia. And when he departed Macedonia, no church entered partnership with him in giving and receiving. That means fellowship. That fellowship with no congregation other than Philippi with regard to giving and receiving. Meaning, they're the only church that supported him. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. So while he was teaching in Thessalonica, they sent him support. Well, we did just read 
that he was working night and day while he was in Thessalonica and in Ephesus too. So he had his secular work making tents and he also accepted support from Philippi, Macedonia, at the same time. We see that in the gospel and that's where he says, I've learned the secret of plenty and hunger, abundance and need. He's doing the right thing with it because it's not just him. It's, as he said in Acts 20, those who are with me. He's taking other people and doing the work with them too and supporting them and providing for their needs that way, which is something he touched on in 1 Corinthians a little obliquely when he said, do we not have the right to take along a sister, a wife. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I've received full payment and more. I'm well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. But Paul's idea is not that he wants to be making money. They need money because they got to eat. Everybody does. That's okay. But he's not trying to make money. He's trying to see the benefit of this. They have fruit. They have made a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God, which ties it right back to 1 Corinthians 9, where he said, those who serve at the temple partake in the food of the temple. Those are the sacrifices that are being offered. They eat those sacrifices. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. This is not a prosperity gospel. He didn't say God will pay you back. Check your bank account in seven days and suddenly you will find. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying there's going to be great blessing, spiritual blessing for you because of this material blessing that you have shared. Finally, we look at 2 Corinthians 11 and 12, closing explanation for why did Paul not take money from them? We have seen that he said, I worked night and day. I supported the weak. I accepted support from Thessalonica or from Philippi, even while I was traveling in Asia or uh, rather in uh, Achaia. And now we get down to it. This is the real problem and it always has been the real problem. And I think it's very important to get to this and, and make that clear. The real issue with support is that without it, you don't have enough teachers. You don't have enough faithful people. And you need it. You need the faithful. Uh, that's what this is really about um, in this case and in every case. What he's trying to get at with this. The church needs it. So undercutting false teachers is the, is the goal, 2 Corinthians 11, uh, and we're, we're here for the rest of the lesson. He said in verses 3 and 4, to begin with, I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus... Than the one we proclaimed. Is that a big deal? Another Jesus, you think? You receive a different spirit from the one you received. A different spirit. Different Holy Spirit. What do you think? Or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted. Galatians 1, anyone? Anyone? Galatians 1, right? Is it okay? It's no big deal. A different Jesus, a different gospel. You put up with that readily enough. That's the issue here. Corinth, I'm afraid because people come and say the stupidest things, but you go on and are cool with them. What is your problem? That's what he's saying. <laughs> what is your problem? Why are you going along with this? I'm afraid. Afraid for what? Afraid of what, right? He's afraid that they're going to leave the faith. They're going to go off into some crazy thing. And they are if they don't repent. If they don't fix their problem of going along to get along. 
5 through 7, Indeed, I consider, I am not in the least inferior to these super apostles. Even if I am unskilled in speaking, I am not so in knowledge. Indeed, in every way we have made this plain to you in all things. Or did I humble my, or did I commit a sin by humbling myself so that you might be exalted because I preached God's gospel to you free of charge? <laughs> Maybe that's the problem, he said. Maybe the problem is that I didn't charge you enough money. And so you thought it, I, I, it wasn't worth it. <laughs> you know, people following the, you get what you pay for. It's an interesting thing that he said. He said, in truth, my reasoning is, I consider, I'm not in the least inferior to these super apostles, the, the fake people who come through with a different Jesus, a different gospel, a different spirit. The fakers. He said, well, uh, yeah, okay, even if I am unskilled at speaking, I'm not so in knowledge. All right, so maybe these people are rhetoricians. Maybe they have excellent presentation and speaking skills, and they have a great voice for radio. See, I have a great face for radio. So, you know, we kind of get along, sort of. But no, he said, whatever that might be, I'm not unskilled in knowledge. I mean, what I'm teaching is still the truth. In fact, it's the stewardship that God entrusted to him. Why aren't they listening to the apostle? Indeed, in every way we made this plain to you in everything. Which we'll talk about. But he said, oh, maybe, you know what? I bet I know what it is. The problem is I committed a sin by humbling myself so that you might be exalted because I preached God's gospel to you free of charge. That's what I did wrong, isn't it? It's worth what you paid for it. No, he's just saying that to, to uh, you know, for didactic purposes. But it's an interesting point to make that, you know, I may not be the best speaker, but what I'm saying is true, and that should be worth more. These fellows coming through that are smooth speakers, they're saying crazy things, and you shouldn't be going along with it. Now, in verses 8 and 9, he said, I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and I was in need, I didn't burden anyone who was there. For the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. In this way, I refrained at that time, and I will continue to refrain from burdening you in any way. Yeah. He's, I robbed other churches, meaning they should, you know, by right, by commandment, by the order of God, Corinth should have paid for the gospel that was being taught them. They did not do so. He took that support from other congregations. And to be fair, you know, sometimes people will say, well, don't, don't they have the obligation to support their own? Well, yes, they do, but sometimes they don't. That's what he's getting at. It happens. And when I was with you and in need, I didn't burden anyone. He said, I was there among you. I was in need, but I did not accept any money from anybody there. The money came from Philippi. That's what I needed, and I took care of it that way. I refrained at that time, and I will refrain in the future from burdening you in any way. He said, I'm not accepting anything. I'm not asking for anything now either which continues into 10 to 13, as the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be silenced in the regions of Achaia. See, he is taking money, just not from Achaia. There's a specific problem here. Why? Because I don't love you? God knows that I do. What I'm doing, I will keep doing in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission, they work on the same terms as we do. He's undermining their claim. They say they're working on the same terms as the apostles, these super apostles. You know, Paul didn't come up with that word. You know that he's quoting what they called themselves. These super apostles have come through. He said, oh, really? You're an apostle, are you? Then 
Why is it that you don't have, right? Where is the revelation from God? Where are the scriptures that you're writing down? By the way, how come you're taking money when you're spreading the gospel in a new place? You shouldn't be doing that because that's not what apostles do. That's what he's saying. I'm undermining their claim. They're not apostles. Such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And, you know, goes into a little side here about Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. His ministers do the same. True. But this is the very point. He said, this is about undercutting these guys. You shouldn't be listening to them. They don't work on the same terms that we do. The 11th verse continues, I've been a fool, you forced me to it. This is because he started in chapter 11 saying, do bear with me in a little folly. (laughs) Because it's foolish for him to defend himself. It's always foolish to defend yourself. That's the truth. You forced me to it. I ought to have been commended by you. I was not at all inferior to these super apostles, even though I'm nothing. (laughs) That's a backdoor, you know. (laughs) Uh, The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with utmost patience, with signs and wonders and mighty works. We did everything. When he said we made this clear in every respect, we've done signs, wonders, many works. We accepted no money from you. You heard the teaching. How could you possibly go along with the glib speakers who are saying the craziest things? In what were you less favored than the rest of the churches, except that I myself did not burden you? Forgive me this wrong. Here for the third time, I'm ready to come to you, and I will not be a burden this time either, for I seek not what is yours but you. Are you saying, I'm coming again, and I'm not taking any money from you? I didn't write 1 Corinthians 9 or 2 Corinthians 11 and 12 so that you would pay me. I'm not going to be paid because I am an apostle. I will not be a burden. I seek not what is yours but you. Children are not obligated to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. Again, um, you know, when you say children and parents like this, okay, it's true. Parents save up for the children. That's true. The provision for the children is made by the parents. Yes. But should we really be in a parent-child relationship? Or shouldn't we be grown up by now? That's what he means when he said, by working hard in this way, we support the weak. Corinth is weak because they're going along with false teachers. They're going along with crazy things, a different Christ, a different gospel, a different spirit. So yeah, they're still children, unfortunately. But he said, I will most gladly spend to be spent for your souls. If I love you more, am I to be loved less? Yeah, he's the one who's paying a price. He's the one who's suffering. But they just don't listen to him. Oh, well, here's the other accusation, right? But granting that I myself did not burden you. I myself did not burden you. I was crafty, you say, and got the better of you by deceit. Did I take advantage of you through any of those whom I sent to you? Aha, see, they're saying, well, see, Paul himself didn't accept the money, but he funneled it through those who were working with him or those that he sent to us later. Except, you know, they took money and that got funneled over to Paul. Which people do all the time. Like there's, people do that all the time in the world. That's why, you know, all, kind, all kinds of corporations and not-for-profits and whatever are there for money laundering, right? Cover up political agendas or whatever else is happening. People do that. Paul's saying, aha, you, I hear this now. You guys saying, well, I didn't take the money, but I got it by other means. no. Did I take advantage of you through any of those whom I sent? I urged Titus to go and sent the brother with him. Did Titus take advantage of you? Did we not act in the same spirit? Did we not take the same steps? Right. 
Nobody that was associated with Paul accepted this. It's what he said in Acts 20. These hands provided for myself and those who were with me. And he just said here, I urged Titus to go and I sent the brother with him. That doesn't mean he turned to this other kid and said, hey, you get on the boat. You know, <laughs> it means he's paid for it. How are they to preach unless they are sent? Romans 10. It means they're paid for. How can they go out into battle? How can you send this soldier out there if they don't have provision? Did we not act in the same spirit? Did we not take the same steps? They did. Those whom Paul sent did exactly what he instructed them to do. Not that they went without support. They just didn't take it from Achaia. He supported them. And finally, the truth is, defending yourself is foolish. The purpose of this is for the upbuilding of the church. In the 19th verse, he closes with, have you been thinking all along that we've been defending ourselves to you? Hmm. It's in the sight of God we've been speaking in Christ and all for your upbuilding, beloved. Yeah, they don't need to defend themselves. They've done what is right. They're doing what is right. They're following the commandments. They're working hard. They don't need defense. This is about the church. We speak in the sight of God in Christ. There's no backdoor dealings. There's no money laundering. There's no crazy, you know, there's no ulterior motive or hidden agenda. It's very open. You shouldn't be listening to false teachers. And I'm trying to undercut them. All for your upbuilding, beloved. It's so that the church might grow in strength and in faith. Which is always the goal of anybody who is a faithful teacher. And that's the end of the support of preaching. It's true. Uh, Paul didn't accept money from them, but that's because he was undercutting false teachers. And it isn't the case that he didn't accept money. He did accept money. Philippi sent him money. How do you think that he provided for himself and a whole bunch of other people like Titus and another helper and whoever else was traveling at the time? He had enough because he had his own income and he had Philippi too and was able to do that. All of that is because he loved them. He wanted the truth to go forward there. He's serving God, whether people accept it or not. And you know, we're all doing this as Christians. We serve God, not man. You're not working to get paid by men. You're, getting, you're working to be paid by God. God is going to repay you in eternity. If today you're not a Christian, become a Christian to have forgiveness of sins to see the blessings that are in the spirit that are in Christ Jesus. We have here water prepared that you might be baptized in his name for forgiveness, where his blood washes away everything. Are you a Christian who has not lived right? Let us pray for you that you might be restored to him, that you might be able to repent in real uh, solid terms and be right with him. We'll pray with you and for you if that is your need in the spirit. If you need to be baptized, if you need to be saved, let that need be known now by coming to the front while together we stand and sing the song selected.